Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining me. My name is Suzanne Mose, and I'm one of the curators here with the City of Niagara Falls Museums. Tonight, we're going to learn a little bit about Niagara Falls' early history, um, along with some early museological history, and we're going to meet a fellow by the name of Thomas Barnett along the way. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're a group of three museums. We're owned and operated by the City of Niagara Falls. Uh, two of our museums are seasonal. We open them in May, shut them down sometime just before Labor Day. And then we have one museum, our flagship, the Niagara Falls History Museum, and it's located near the intersection of Maine and Ferry. I've been here in the Niagara region and with the museum for almost nine years now. And prior to that, I worked with the municipal collections for the city of Adelaide in South Australia. I was there for about nine years. And prior to that, I was with the city of Toronto's culture division and I was with them for about two years. Um, and I didn't grow up around here. I grew up on the other end of Lake Ontario near Kingston. So I'm still very much a newcomer to, to the Niagara region and to its history. Upon arrival, I remember thinking just how rich this area is with Canada's early history. War of 1812 and how instrumental that was in the Niagara region. Uh, black history, the Underground Railroad and all of the stories that came out of that. But separate to that national history and what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about tonight is local history history and stories that relate directly to the city of Niagara Falls um, and, and those millions of gallons of water that go over the brink every day. If you think about um, the area that surrounds the falls, it, it's an interesting dichotomy. If you're standing on the Niagara Parkway or River Road and you're looking at the falls, you experience something absolutely unique and marvelous about the world we live in, that very rich natural history. And if you do a 180 and you turn around, you see a man-made marvel in and of itself. And I've had a lot of conversations about that dichotomy since I arrived here. I sort of call it my Mr. and Mrs. Ohio chat. And it certainly doesn't have to take place between me and anybody from Ohio. But what I mean by that is I talk to newcomers that come for the very first time. They've never been to Niagara Falls before. And I love to get their impressions of what they expected to see when they arrived and then maybe what they did see when they got here. And quite often, people are very unaware how close the falls are to the urban environment of of the city of Niagara Falls and that man-made marvel um, that I very affectionately call the dog and pony show. In order to better understand this dichotomy or the this and the that of Niagara Falls, I found it really helpful to look back in history. And when I have these conversations with people, they seem quite fascinated when I, when I start to talk about where it all began. Um, so I'm going to talk tonight about the story of Thomas Barnett and how really his story helped to shape the Niagara Falls that, that we see today. So let's take you back just quickly about 350 years to see what's considered to be the first image of Niagara Falls ever published. This image is attributed to Father Hennepin. He was a Flemish priest and he journeyed here in 1678 with the famous explorer La Salle. Niagara Falls was part of the North American exploration journey that they were on. Interestingly enough though, the image wasn't published until many years after he was here. About five years after uh, he had been here as part of the North American tour he was on, he did write a report and in that there was a description of the Grand Falls that he'd seen, but there was no illustration. And it wasn't until 14 years after that, which takes us to 1697, that there was an illustration created. So perhaps while he was here, he had made some notes, maybe he had done his own sketch, but the assumption is, is that he would have engaged an artist to create this drawing um, from, like I said, memory, notes, perhaps a sketch that he had made while he was here all those years earlier. So while it's pretty unlikely that Hennepin and his party were thinking about tourism while they were here in 1678, I, I think it is worth noting just how early the fascination with Niagara Falls began with 
the Europeans that were starting to come to this part of, of the world at that time in history. Now I'm going to fast forward about 150 years from when Hennepin visited the falls. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to Thomas Barnett. So Thomas Barnett is a favorite of mine. Uh, he was the proprietor of the Niagara Falls Museum, which is purported to be the oldest museum in Canada and potentially the oldest museum in North America. So that's that early museological history I had mentioned. Thomas Barnett's earliest years of existence in his world of museums here in North America were not actually here in Niagara Falls. There's documentation showing us that he was actually in Kingston in his very early days. There's a newspaper article from May of 1830 that talks about his fine collection of natural curiosities. So what we know about Thomas at this point is that he would be classified as an educated man. He would have been able to read and write. He was a trained taxidermist and a cabinet maker, so two good skill sets to have when opening up a museum. It's not that long after we see that note in the Kingston newspaper that we know Thomas has found his way to Niagara Falls. So it's 1831 that he establishes himself here, and it's in an existing building, a building that's down along River Road or the front as it was known then. Uh, we believe it was a brewery originally, uh, right at the foot of Murray Street, so um, across from the American Falls. So as Barnett begins to make his mark here, I feel confident that he knew he was on to something good. I think he probably knew that the magnificence of those falls and the word that was spreading around to draw people here would give him the visitors that he would need uh, in order to create and have an, a successful uh, establishment. And the way I see it, it, it's the early game of tourism is beginning right at this point in, in history. We know that his museum was mentioned in some of the very earliest guidebooks that we have that speak about uh, the collection. And we know that his museum is actually marked on some of the early maps. On this map from 1831, you can see that the museum is shown. It's one of the few buildings, the only building that's there along the front, um, just down from Table Rock. There's an, a, a guidebook that's printed in 1835, declaring that the museum rooms were calculated to delight the eye, improve the understanding, and mend the heart. So like I said, I think he knows he's on to something pretty good here. Um, and pretty sure that the community that was living here at the time would have classified Thomas in that level of sort of a, an upwardly mobile young gentleman. It's pretty reasonable to assume that he was having some success here in Niagara Falls in that location. It's less than a decade later in 1837 that we know Barnett moves the location of his museum. He gets himself south, so a little closer to the brink of the falls, a little closer to Table Rock, and he's built himself a museum at this point in time. You can see it in this image here. It's described in some of the readings as rough cast. So there's balcony out front that would have been uh, a great spot for people to stand and look and observe the falls themselves. There's an observation tower that's ultimately built on the top. Again, a place for visitors to go experience just a little bit more of everything that was happening here in Niagara at the time while they were visiting his museum. Thomas exists here in this building for more than 20 years and the tourist trade in the area would have been continuing to boom when we're looking at this first half of the 19th century. By now we would have seen the first suspension bridge built across the river, that was in 1848. So that would have made the museum and all the other offerings that were springing up along the, along the front um, so much more accessible. People wouldn't have had to adhere to ferry schedules anymore. The comings and the goings from the American side to the um, Canadian side just were really starting to, to change the volume of people that we were seeing here in Niagara at that time. Along with the, the new establishment that Barnett had built, he began to incorporate other tourist attractions into his growing business. There was a staircase, for example, that he operated that would allow visitors to descend down the gorge, and then once at the bottom of the gorge, they had the opportunity to travel behind the great falling sheet of water. 
In this handbill, we can see Barnett's enthusiasm for his new establishment. Like the falls themselves, I think Barnett saw himself and his museum as a place where people could come and, and learn and marvel and make lasting memories. And to this end, Thomas filled the space with hundreds of curiosities and natural wonders, which as a taxidermist made sense. And this was all very much in keeping with the philosophy held by museums at that time. So I like to think of it as um, a cabinet of curiosities. Again, that's something that was very typical of museums at this time back in England. So I believe that that was Thomas's vision of what he needed to create here in Niagara. This is a time in history when literacy rates are low and access to resources very limited. I mean, there's no Google and there's no well-stocked local library. And even if there was, many people wouldn't have been able to read or write. So again, I think Thomas saw his specimens as resources for people. They were proof that marvels from around the world and from faraway places really did exist. They were tangible and they weren't just something that maybe you heard about through stories or lore. I think all of that really appealed to Thomas. Um, I think he felt it legitimized him and what he was trying to do here. We know, for example, that he would often offer half price admission for visitors that couldn't afford to pay the full price of admission that he was asking. We know that he let teachers and students in for free. So it seems to me that he was a genuine collector and he took a lot of pride in the products that he was creating and displaying. In 1852, the Boston Journal printed, few people visit Niagara Falls without calling at Barnett's museum, and few are disappointed. Now enter the villain, from where I sit anyway, of my story, and that's Saul Davis. Saul Davis was a gentleman from Buffalo, and it's he who gives Thomas his first real bit of direct competition for what Thomas was offering visitors at that point in time. Davis was the proprietor of the Prospect House, which was built in 1844. It is south of Barnett's Museum and just a little bit closer yet to the brink at the Horseshoe Falls and to Table Rock. It's essentially a hotel. It was a place where visitors could come for food, drink, and lodging. But we know that uh, somewhere in these early days of Niagara Falls tourism, Davis also built and operated a staircase to descend the gorge. And these men quickly became fierce, fierce rivals. The staircases themselves seem to be at the root of so much of their conflict. The fighting went on for years and years about who did or didn't have the legal rights to operate them, who should and shouldn't have access to them, who would have to pay to use the rights for them. It really was at the root of so much of the conflict between these two men. As Davis further establishes himself along the front, he continues to have success right alongside Barnett. And in 1854, he builds his Table Rock House. It's a pretty magnificent building. You can see it here with its domed roof and its perfect proximity to the brink of the Horseshoe Falls. In this next photo, you can also see its proximity to one of Barnett's other buildings, sometimes known as Barnett's Table Rock House, um, shown here in the foreground with the sign on the front that says the Canadian Indian Store. So sadly, the competition between these gentlemen continues, and it's not healthy competition. It turned into extreme and often violent situations that included arson, homicide, and just regular ongoing legal battles and legal actions between these two. By all accounts, Davis was a pretty ruthless guy. He was a man that seemed to have little regard for the law or the satisfaction of his visitors. It was very well documented that he was known to misrepresent himself and his products to his guests. In 1867, the Hamilton Evening Times ran a series of articles exposing Saul Davis and calling his establishment the Den of Forty Thieves. Mr. Davis sued the Times for libel in 1868, but lost that suit based on the strong testimony given by tourists who had been treated appallingly by him. Near the end of the 1850s, we know that Barnett sends home to England for architectural plans, 
building plans for his next site along Niagara's ever-expanding front. This is a really grand building. It's the grandest or one of the grandest on either side of the river at this point. And it's located directly beside the museum that he had built in the 1830s. And what he does with this building is he turns it into a hotel. It's called the Museum Hotel. You can also see the dome of Table Rock House just a little further down the street in the background of this photograph. The grounds of Thomas's new museum included ponds, greenhouses, terraces, cages with wild animals in them, and his museum had really now become the quintessential Victorian cabinet of curiosities. By then, he was displaying thousands of specimens, foreign and domestic. His collections were vast and they included bugs, birds, fish, mammals, reptiles, eggs, fossils, shells, statues, paintings, mummies, and lots of other antiquities. As a trained taxidermist, it seemed that he collected and he displayed almost everything he could. Uh, we know that he was known to mount the creatures that the local people would bring him, even their beloved pets, uh, any other sort of beastly oddity that he might encounter. And anyone who visited was bound to see and very much remember the two-headed calf or the three-eyed pig. We also know that Mr. Barnett stuffed and displayed his own cherished companion, Skipper, Skipper was a small dog born with only two hind legs and Barnett actually built Skipper a wheeled contraption that had allowed the little dog some freedom and some mobility. It was a, a common sight at the time to see Thomas and Skipper out for their daily walks with the small dog propped up on this little set of wheels. The front continued to gain notoriety in this early incarnation of Niagara Falls tourism. It was only a quarter of a mile long and 300 yards wide, but every type of huckster and cheat could soon be found there. Sideshow and carnival-like attractions grew as the number of visitors came from far and wide to see Niagara Falls. Along with observation towers, there were freak shows, snake dens, battle reenactments, and daredevils. During this time when the front resembled Canada's own Wild West, we began to see the regular introduction of the Niagara Falls Daredevil. And this is something that became really a regular occurrence for many years. Eventually the town would put in bylaws to try to eliminate and control these practices that were growing so rapidly in this first incarnation of the dog and pony show. We have a document in the collection that stated from January of 1866, in which the town of Clifton, now Niagara Falls, is petitioning the government to transfer the land rights for the staircases back to the municipality. The claim states that the actions of Thomas Barnett and Saul Davis are discouraging tourism and giving the town of Clifton a bad name. It goes on to talk about the destruction of the staircases and of the path that's underneath the falls. And I'm afraid to say that Thomas's story has a bit of a tragic ending. The competition along the front and the, the bitter legal fights between he and Davis just simply buried him financially. And eventually, in 1878, his museum and its entire contents were put up for auction. And just to make this whole story a little bit more tragic, the person who bought the entire lot that day was Saul Davis. Davis operated the museum and Barnett's other concessions on the Canadian side for about 10 more years until eventually the land along the front was expropriated by the Queen Victoria Park Commission, now known as the Niagara Parks Commission. At this point, Davis went looking for a new home for the collection and he moved ultimately to the other side of the river in 1888. And it, the, the collection stayed there until 1958 and that's when it returned to the Canadian side, where it remained until its final closing in 1999. Many people that I meet at our museum today will remember visiting it here on the Canadian side in the last few decades. It resided on River Road in the old Spirella corset factory. Now it's probably more recognizable as Bird Kingdom. 
Billy Jameson was a collector and a dealer out of Toronto, and it was he who purchased the entire collection. This is sort of where we come in to the picture just a little bit. Jameson repatriates and sells the collection from 1999 at the time of purchase until his death in 2011. We were contacted by his estate in 2014 because there were things that they had that they thought should come back to the city and they wanted to know if we were interested in bringing some of the original Barnett collection into our current city museum. So just quickly before we wrap up tonight, I'll show you a few of the objects that we were able to acquire and that we now have in our collection. Firstly, we have Skipper and he takes pride of place in our community gallery where you can see him on display in the tourism case. He's a really interesting little character to get up close and, and have a look at. He's in really great condition when you consider the fact that he's probably between 150 and 175 years old. I think everyone at our museum has a certain amount of affection for Skipper because we know the story behind he and Thomas Barnett. Another important set of artifacts that we were able to acquire from the Jameson estate was this group of ledgers. We have 59 of these ledgers or registers in total and they date from 1838 to 1997. What we know Thomas started was a tradition of a guest book at the front of the museum. So all of his visitors that came through were invited to sign their name and let us know where they were visiting from and of course include the date. There are some pretty intriguing names included in these ledgers. We found um, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, P.T. Barnum himself, and our own Sir John A. MacDonald, several royals, Pretty much anyone that would have been coming to Niagara Falls, especially in those early days, would have visited Barnett's museum and, and was sure to sign the ledger. And the final item that I'll just show you tonight is probably my favorite of the group of things that we were able to acquire, and it's this spectacular example of Victorian bug art. And the words you see to raise the genius and mend the heart, Niagara Falls Museum's T. Barnett, are beautifully arranged with bugs, beetles actually, and it's a really great example of a Victorian oddity. We've had it conserved by the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa, and it's going on display in our community gallery as well. It was interesting to find out that most of the beetles in the piece are local to southern Ontario in the Niagara region. So I like to think that it might have been Thomas himself who created this piece. Thank you all for joining me this evening. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about our local history and the early days of Niagara Falls tourism.